Okay, so this is the, I, I'm Jeremiah Johnson, and this is the second week, the second installment of the weekly Sonneteer. And uh, again, the, re the reason I've kind of started this is I'm, you know, I'm a lecturer teacher at the University of North Georgia in Dahlonega, Georgia, and um, kind of, you know, the inspiration for this was to stir up a greater interest in poetry in my students, and particularly in a form of poetry called the sonnet. And the sonnet, you know, goes back hundreds and hundreds of years, but it's, it's still this form of poetry, this structure of poetry that that many poets write in today across a wide range of cultural backgrounds um and so yeah i'm just like what what is it about the sonnet that still captivates us that we still in it in a day and age you know with modern and contemporary poetry there's a lot of emphasis on not worrying so much about the structure on you know, more thinking about just how to really punch your feelings out there. And so, but, but the sonnet is this structured form that for some reason still fascinates us, even though uh, writers do like to play a lot more fast and loose sometimes with its structure than in the past. Um, you know, the traditional sonnet is 14 lines long. And each, so each line of a traditional sonnet follows this pattern, this flow, which the technical term for it, for it is iambic pentameter. And I am is basically two syllables put together, which make this sound da-da. Pentameter, penta means five, and meter is the flow. So iambic pentameter means that each line of the poem sounds like this. Da-da, 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 da-da. Five da-da's, okay? That is, that is iambic pentameter, when each line follows that da-da, 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 da-da. Um, and we'll look at that more in a minute. So it's a traditional sonnet is 14 lines. It follows the pattern in each line of the da-da's, and it rhymes. And that's that's kind of the, the typical structure of it, okay? Um, and it, it, again, it's kind of like today, people, you know, a lot of people will be like, why would you want to punch yourself into that box? Because we're all, we're just about expressing ourselves these days. But there's something about that confinement that is enabling. One of my favorite lines of poetry, which comes from a sonnet, is by William Wordsworth, this British romantic poet uh, who lived a couple hundred years ago. Um, William Wordsworth, he, so he wrote this line, and in this, it, he wrote 500 sonnets. Wordsworth wrote 500 sonnets, so he spent a lot of time with them, really liked them, obviously. Um, and in one of his sonnets, you have this line. He says, nuns fret not at their convent's narrow walls. Nuns fret not at their convent's narrow walls. And what does that mean? Well, if you watch, you know, Hollywood movies, you know, these days, or you know, a lot of uh, primetime television, you get this impression that nuns and monks are these desperate, sexually repressed people just trying to get out, you know, um, with all these accompanying psychological issues and whatnot, right? But Wordsworth, who wasn't Catholic, but um, Wordsworth was like, I I'm not sure that nuns feel repressed and are desperately trying to get out. What if nuns, you know, like that feeling of structure in their lives. It's kind of like driving down the interstate. There's something about having that dotted line on one side and that straight line on the other side. 
that just, as my grandfather used to say, keep it, when you're driving, keep it between the mayonnaise and the mustard, i.e. the yellow line and the white line, right? And there's something about the, those lines, that structure, that on the one hand, yes, it is restrictive, you know? Um, and the, the turning lights coming up behind us, right? You know, that's, it's restrictive, but it's also enabling, right? And it enables us to go on road trips safely, you know, to navigate our way through cities, to go places, to see things. And so there's something about restrictions that can also be enabling. And I think that's why the sonnet has stuck with us. And many people still, many poets still use it today. You know, they don't use it all the time, but they do like to, to go back to it and work with it. I do have to say a lot of modern sonnets, they, they drop the rhyme. You know, a sonnets are supposed to rhyme. Uh, that 14 lines, iambic pentameter, and rhyming, right? And a lot of poets drop that these days. They also, a lot of them drop the meter, you know, the flow. They still, a, a lot of people still keep 10 syllables to a line. So da 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 that's 10 syllables, right? But they drop the da 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 the flow of it. Uh, most of them still stick to 14 lines. So in our day of don't restrict me, don't give me boundaries, you know, um, uh, a lot of the traditional rules get broken on the sonnets, but there's still this idea of these 14 lines and usually these 10 syllables and like purposefully restricting myself so that within that space, I can create something. I can transcend myself within this, within these restrictions. Hopefully that makes some sense. I'll talk about that more in, in later episodes of this. Um, so let's, yeah, the, uh, another thing I want to talk about here briefly is there are two, there's typically two kinds of sonnets. One is called, and they were invented by two different guys, basically. Uh, one is called the Petrarchan sonnet. One is called the Shakespearean sonnet. The, the last episode where we looked at the poem, The New Colossus, that, that is called a Shakespearean sonnet. And basically what it means is a Shakespearean sonnet is, is kind of divided up into four sections. The first three sections are each four lines and they rhyme within themselves. Um, the first three sections, which are four lines each, are kind of developing the main idea. And then the last two lines are like, they make the main point or they put a different put a twist on everything. So the last two lines are kind of like a twist on the rest of the poem, or they're kind of making the main point. You know, they're doing something themselves to wrap up the poem. So three sections of four lines and then one two-line couplet, it's called. That's a Shakespearean sonnet. And that is the new Colossus, what we looked at last episode, if you want to look at that again. But for this episode, we're going to look at a poem by a poet named Eleanor Wiley. <clears throat> and Eleanor Wiley, she wrote, well, we'll come back to it. So we just talked a little bit about the Shakespearean sonnet, one of the two traditional types of sonnets. And now I'll come and we'll talk in, the, talk in just a second about the second type of sonnet, which is what we're looking at today. But Eleanor Wiley, she was a poet who was popular in the 1920s and 1930s. Uh, if you're familiar with Edna St. Vincent Millay, she was kind of Edna St. Vincent Millay before Millay came along. You know, she was uh, kind of, I don't know, a beatnik before beatniks. Um, and uh, she was a socialite, right? And and I just love her stuff. I love the way she writes about nature. She's very similar to in the same sense of Malay in that way. Uh, but today we're going to be looking at one of Eleanor Wiley's poems, which is called Wild Peaches. And the link, by the way, to this poem 
is down below the video. So if you wanna pull that up to look at as I talk, you're welcome to do that. So I've, I've got it up in front of me right now. So this, po uh, this poem, Wild Peaches, it's actually six sonnets, okay? Six sonnets in a row. This is one of Eleanor Wiley's more famous poems. We're just gonna look at the first sonnet, sonnet number one. It's my favorite. Um, so I'm gonna read it to you. And one thing, you know, I often talk with people who are like, I don't really get poetry, so I don't read it. And one thing I sometimes ask them is, well, how many times do you read a poem, right? Usually they tell me, oh, once, right? I, t I typically, you know, read poems two, three, even four times, you know? Um, and so I'm kind of like, if you've just read a poem once, it's no surprise you didn't get it. If it was worth reading at all, you're not going to get it after the first time. You know, it may take you three or four readings to really get the gist of it and see just the, the artistry of it. So I, I'm going to read this one twice for you. Um, so Wild Peaches, Sonnet 1. When the world turns completely upside down, you say we'll immigrate to the eastern shore. Above, above ah, you say we'll immigrate to the eastern shore, aboard a riverboat from Baltimore. We'll live among wild peach trees, miles from town. You'll wear a coonskin cap, and I a gown, homespun dyed butternut's dark gold color. Lost, like your lotus-eating ancestor, we'll swim in milk and honey till we drown. The winter will be short, the summer long, the autumn amber-hued, sunny and hot, tasting of cider and of scuppernong. All seasons sweet, but autumn best of all. The squirrels in their silver fur will fall like falling leaves, like fruit before your shot. Okay, I'll read it again. When the world turns completely upside down, you say we'll immigrate to the eastern shore, aboard a riverboat from Baltimore. We'll live among wild peach trees, miles from town. You'll wear a coonskin cap, and I a gown, homespun, dyed butternut's dark gold color. Lost, like your lotus-eating ancestor, we'll swim in milk and honey till we drown. The winter will be short, the summer long, the autumn amber-hued, sunny and hot, tasting of cider and of scuppernong. All seasons sweet, but autumn best of all. The squirrels in their silver fur will fall like falling leaves, like fruit before you're shot. All right, so first off with this poem, like we said, um, uh, it's one of the two traditional types of poetry, one being the Shakespearean sonnets. Again, see the new Colossus, the first installment in this series, which is like three sections of four lines, and then the clincher or the twist comes in the last two lines, the couplet. This poem, uh, Sonnet One of Wild Peaches by Eleanor Wiley, this poem is called a Petrarchan sonnet named after Petrarch, the guy who kind of created this form, who lived, who predated Shakespeare by at least a couple hundred years. So this is actually the older form of traditional sonnets. It's called a Petrarchan sonnet, which basically means you've got your first section has eight lines and your second section has six lines, okay? And the first section rhymes within itself. You've got down in town, gown and drown, shore and moor, color and ancestor. Uh, your second stanza, uh, a stanza is a section of a poem. You've got um, long, nong, hot, shot, and all fall. And so a Petrarchan sonnet, you've got these two, stan these two sections of it, an eight line and a six line segment. And basically, the six-line segment is what the two-line segment, the couplet, is in the Shakespearean sonnet. It kind of gives you a, a new perspective, right? Um, helps to hone your perspective or present a new perspective, right? So, now that we've talked a little bit about just the form of the poetry, I want to just unpack it line by line for you. When the world turns completely upside down. This is like when the world ends, you know? 
um, be it a civil war, be it, you know, a zombie apocalypse, whatever, when the world turns completely upside down, when society goes nuts, you say, and, you know, um, I kind of imagine, you know, a, uh, a woman say, you know, or a, a female college student saying to her boyfriend or whatever, you know, um, she says, you know, she says to, to her boyfriend, she's like, you say we'll immigrate, or it could be her fiance or her husband or whatever. You say we'll immigrate to the Eastern shore above a riverboat from Baltimore. So when everything goes nuts, you say we're gonna hop on a riverboat, you know, and we're gonna leave the city and go to the woods. We're gonna immigrate to the woods. We'll live among wild peach trees. We'll just pick our food right off the trees, you know, miles from town. You'll wear a coonskin cap which if you don't know Coonskin Cap is, Google it. It's kind of Davy Crockett wear, you know who he was. Uh, you'll wear a Coonskin Cap and I a gown, homespun. I'm gonna wear a homemade dress, dyed butternuts, dark gold color. Um, so they're gonna live off the land, right? And make their own clothes and stuff. Lost, like your lotus eating ancestor, will swim in milk and honey till we drown. I love these two lines because these are two literary illusions thrown in here. The first, the lotus-eating ancestor, um, is an allusion to, you know, uh, the Odyssey, which is one of the great works of, of world literature, of Greek literature specifically. You may have read parts of it in high school or even college. Uh, basically, the Odyssey is the story of this guy, Odysseus, and his men, who are trying to sell back to their home after they've just fought in this war. So they've just fought in a war and won it. They're trying to get home, but the gods, the gods are not happy with the way they won the war. Particularly, they're not happy with Odysseus because he kind of tricked the enemy to win. And so the gods are giving Odysseus and his men all this trouble. It's taking them years to get home. And so at one point, they, they end up stopping on this island, and it is the island of the lotus eaters. And these people who live on this island, when they eat this plant, the lotus, they forget everything. You know, they forget their past. They forget, you know, home and all of that. And so some of Odysseus's men eat these lotus plants, and suddenly they don't remember they're trying to get home anymore, right? And Odysseus has to, I think, basically tie them up and get them back on the ship, right? And this one guy ends up being left. One of the sailors gets left because I guess they can't find him. And so when she says lost, like your lotus-eating ancestor, um, it's like, she's like, you know, you say we're just going to go off in the woods and we're going to forget the world, right? We're going to forget our troubles, forget the world. We'll swim in milk and honey till we drown. Uh, in the in the Old Testament of the Bible, you know, God, after bringing the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt, he tells them he's taking them to a new land that is flowing with milk and honey. So it's like paradise, you know? We're going to swim in paradise and forget the world until we drown, right? Drowning in pleasure, um, in the beauty of nature, right? In forgetfulness. Okay, the second stanza... In the second stanza, it kind of switches themes a bit, or ideas, and it just unpacks what life in the woods is going to be like from the perspective of the four seasons. So she says, the winter will be short, the summer long. Isn't that nice? We don't need to worry about the winter. It's going to be short. The summer long, the autumn amber hued, this beautiful color, sunny and hot, tasting of cider like apple cider and of scuppernong, this fruit. All seasons sweet. So the weather, whatever season, is just going to be wonderful. But autumn, best of all. In autumn, so autumn's going to be the best season. In autumn, what's going to happen? The squirrels in their silver fur will fall like falling leaves, like fruit before you're shot. Okay. So, um, you know, a couple of things about this poem. As we, as we go back to the beginning, right? Um, it's interesting, in, in previous classes when we've looked at this poem, some of my students have commented 
that they wonder if this poem is idealist, as idealistic as it seems at first shot. Like, because it seems very naive and idealistic. Oh, winter, we don't need to worry about winter. Oh, eating, we'll just pick peaches off the trees, right? Um, and it sounds very idealistic, but, but uh, one student interpreted that you say, not as you say we'll immigrate, but you say, as in maybe, you know, maybe the girl is doubtful about, you know, her boyfriends or fiancés, whoever's plans, right? She's like, you say, but I feel a little bit skeptical, right? So maybe under the surface, there's a little skepticism under the, uh, the, I, the naive idealism of the poem. Who knows? Um, line five, the reference to the coonskin cap, and then going down to the last line, talking about hunting squirrels, you know, it, it, it makes me think that possibly, you know, um, this poem, if it was written today, might not have been quite as big a hit as it was back then, because these days a lot more people, um, uh, people are not as comfortable with wearing with wearing fur caps, you know, raccoon skins on their heads and stuff, and, and hunting squirrels and stuff. But, you know, it's, it's a very traditional, how do you live off the land? Well, you, you kill animals and you wear their skins and you, you hunt, you know, um, as well as growing. That's, that's how you live out in nature. And so it's kind of like a throwback to the past, which is what it would be like, right? I mean, say civilization collapses, we're all going to be going, we're all going to be back to wearing animal skins and, you know, uh, living off the land, right? But these last two lines, whatever you may think or not think of shooting squirrels, right? Um, the squirrels in their silver fur will fall like falling leaves, like fruit before your shot. Stylistically, these two lines are beautiful because of something called alliteration, which alliteration is when you're rhyming not the ends of words, but the beginnings of words. And it's several words in a row. So fur, fall, falling, fruit, before. This is alliteration. And it's just beautifully done in these last two lines, right? Um, uh, back in medieval times, you know, uh, they got a bit carried away with the alliteration, like whole poems were like these last two lines, and it can get a little tiresome at times, but, but to just have it for a couple of lines here, you know, where she gives it to you in the end, I feel like really does something for the poem, as do the two literary allusions um, in the last two lines of the first stanza, right? If the whole poem was literary illusions, it might be kind of hurting your head, right? But to just have two stuck in there, you know, those two lines at the end of stanza one, and then to really bring out that alliteration at the end of stanza two, there's something about just that sh those short bursts of technical beauty, so to speak, right? Okay. So that is Wild Peaches by Eleanor Wiley. And, you know, uh, I mean, of, of course, you know, clicking like is, is appreciated, but even more, I would value your thoughts, your written thoughts on these talks. So if you wanna, if you wanna drop a little note down at the end there and just tell me, you know, um, if, if this provokes any, any further thought for you on these poems as you're listening to these talks. Thank you. See you next week. Bye.